Hey guys, welcome back to Big Strong Book. I am Reed, and today we are discussing The Cosmic Puppets by Philip K. Dick. So, as I'm sure some of you have seen on this channel, I've gone through a couple of Philip K. Dick's novels so far, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and a few days ago, The Man in the High Castle. Well, I'm back with a third book, this one is much shorter than the others. Um, this book, The Cosmic Puppets, is only about 140 pages. I think I read this in an hour and a half. It is an extremely digestible novel, but that isn't a bad thing, as you'll see here in my thoughts about it. Um, and so when people think of the, the work of Philip K. Dick, I feel like they often split it at least in terms of the the writing that he the science fiction writing that he did in the 50s which could be considered more pulp versus kind of man in the high castle and afterwards where the the subject the the style and subject of his books stays in the science fiction realm but it matures it's not as like adventurous and carefree and pulpy. And so I did not know what to expect when reading one of the, the eight pulp novels that he wrote in the 50s. And I was very, I was pleasantly surprised by this book. I'm happy, happy to report. Um, so, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just read the back of the book here because it does a, a pretty good job at, uh, setting up the the scope of the of this book all right the cosmic puppets begins like an episode of the twilight zone and then ramps up the strangeness and fantasy to epic levels because the mystery is about more than one man or one town this is a battle between gods following an inexplicable urge ted barton returns to his idyllic virginia hometown for a vacation but when he gets there, he is shocked to discover that it has utterly changed. The stores and houses are all different, and he doesn't recognize anybody. The mystery deepens when he checks the town's historical records and reads that he died nearly 20 years earlier. As he attempts to cover, uncover the secrets of the town, Barton is drawn deeper into the puzzle and into a supernatural battle that could decide the fate of the universe. Now that sounds like an extremely ambitious and lofty story. And so you might approach this book thinking, it's short, it's practically a novella, but you know, it works so well. I think even though it does, you might think it aims high, it does so and it approaches maybe it's loftier scope in such a great way. When I reviewed The Man in the High Castle, I mentioned that it was a little too big for its britches. And I meant that in this novel, it's the not too old, not too cold, but I think this one is just right. So as the synopsis of the book indicates, we follow a man named Ted Barton, um, who, is who decides to take a little detour on a vacation and go to his hometown of Millgate, Virginia. But as he goes in, he notices that everything has changed around him. He doesn't recognize anybody in the town. All the street names are different. All the stores are different. All the stores are owned by different people. And yes, he investigates into the records and he realizes that he died 20 years ago when he was nine years old and he's so confused. And I agree with the back of the book and I was thinking this just as I was reading it. It's like a Twilight Zone episode. Um, similar to... Uh, Oh, gosh. Um, walk, walking Distance, I think is what it's called. It's one of the very first episodes of the first season of The Twilight Zone, in which a guy, an ad executive, goes back and finds himself near his hometown. And even though it's not like he had died, he goes back in time and sees the town. That's this is It's kind of what I reminded of. But there are also other Twilight Zone episodes that deal with identity, the loss of identity, so I'm going to start to get into some spoilers for this novel now. Um, so Ted ends up meeting a guy named Christopher in the town. 
and he they both realized that they were actually they remember the town that Ted remembers. Christopher knows that this town that he is in is not real. And so Christopher invites Ted over to his house and he puts on this cone and he takes an object, a wine bottle, and he really concentrates on the wine bottle and it turns into a coffee grinder. And he says, the coffee grinder is real. The wine bottle is not real, it's fake. The coffee grinder is what I had in my house before this all happened. So then Ted realizes and Christopher realizes that if they think hard enough and use their memories and really concentrate their memories, they can begin to change objects in the town to what they were before. That's where it kind of gets into the, the pulpy atmosphere, like they can really just use the power of their minds to do this. Then there are also these creatures that wander, called wanderers, and they can pass through buildings and they look like they are human, but they can move through people, move through objects. They are people that were remnants of the town from before, um, but they have to move around, they have to go around town with their eyes closed because if they see the, the, the constructed fiction, they will forget the town from before and then they will disappear and they will cease to be real or exist anymore. And so we then realize that there is a cosmological battle between Peter and Mary. Peter is a god and Mary is kind of a demigod. So this novel really gets into um, Zoroastrianism, if I'm saying the name of that religion correctly. So Zoroastrianism, as I understand it, is one of the world's oldest religions. And in it are two deities, kind of the God and the, or the, the Yahweh and Satan, or Lucifer of this religion, as you will, if you will. Um, there is uh, Ormazd, and Ormazd is the benevolent creator god deity. And um, Ahriman is uh, like Satan. And so they realize that, and the Mary's father, a doctor, uh, tells them, hey, like, this is a cosmological battle. You know, that the, the battle between Ormazd and Ahriman has been going on for millions, if not billions of years. And it won't end in this town. They're just using this town as a, one battle in that greater war. And Ahriman cast the shroud over the town to control. Ormazd is the town from before. So it's very interesting how Dick interweaves these narratives of identity that Ted Barton is facing, as well as the character Christopher, as well as the themes of religion, that your identity can be involved in battles between good and evil, that if you forget your way, if you forget the core of your character, the core of who you are and where you came from, evil will win. And it's that's such a simple um, theme, but it works so well. I think that if this novel was 300 or 400 pages, this conflict would seem silly. But I think because it's short, it just, it works so well. It's able to stick to really just the, the, that main theme of identity and identity in, in the midst of religious warfare and religious conflict on a cosmological scale, not like, you know, Protestants versus Catholics or anything like that. You know, like a, 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 a creator benevolent deity versus the Lord of the underworld, that kind of classic mythological conflict. Um, you know, that, that's what Dick is telling the reader. Dick is telling the reader to never forget yourself, never forget your identity, because the moment you really start to forget yourself or feed into a narrative that others have created about you, 
that's when you'll lose yourself forever. And, and he, yeah, and he transposes that within this battle between good and evil. So I think I would rate this a four out of five. Um, this book definitely has the highest recommendation I can bestow. Um, you know, it, it, it was very good and it didn't overstay its welcome. It felt like, you know, just 140 pages that this book, as short as it is, is the perfect length. So if you're looking for good, uh, pulpy fun, I would highly recommend this. So The Cosmic Puppets by Philip K. Dick. Check it out.